Hey folks, Ryan Gill here with Hunt Primitive, where we entertain, educate, and inspire to help others accomplish their own primitive building and hunting goals. Thanks for joining us today on an episode of Secrets and Science Chapters, where we go through and break down individual chapters from the Secrets and Science collection of books. In today's episode, we're going to talk about the correlations between hunting and experimental archaeology, and that starts on page 18 on the Secrets and Science of Primitive Archery. So we'll kind of work through this one here together. All right, we'll start off by reading through, and it starts off as, It is important to note that I am a hunter first and foremost. I am an unapologetic hunter regardless of others' opinions or emotions of hunting. I was raised hunting and my experiences in hunting give me a vastly different, unique, and rare perspective of primitive hunting than those that do not hunt. Primitive hunting cannot be replicated without hunting. No amount of research or in-lab experiments or carcass testing can accumulate more accurate data or experience than actual building and hunting with these implements. So if we just back that up slightly, I think it should be pretty straightforward, but basically what I'm saying in the book is that I am a hunter first and foremost. So I grew up hunting. I grew up in a hunting family. My dad took me at a very, very young age. I was exposed to it. And primitive hunting is something that I took to without a doubt more than anything. I absolutely feel it was a gift that was given and I always want to pass that along to other people. And whether I was going to be doing this book or not, I was still going to be out hunting for food regardless. So then I go on to discuss that primitive hunting cannot be replicated without actual hunting. So no amount of research in lab experiments or carcass testing can give accurate data. And that goes into where we start talking about the correlations between hunting and experimental archaeology. So we will cover that here very, very shortly. So we'll read just a little further. Experimental archaeology or practical application archaeology, as I prefer to call it in this case, uh, or the data collection found in this book is not the result of me killing for the purpose of this study. So now that we've covered that is we already covered that I've been a hunter, grew up, and I'm a hunter first and foremost, and that any of the hunts that we did in this book and all the information for this book was not solely to make the book. So basically, I'm going to be hunting one way or another. This book and the others is just one more way to collect data and use that animal to its fullest. So we, we might be able to use its meat or its hide or some bones or what have you, data collection, and then sharing that data with others so they may do it more efficiently is yet one more way that we can use that animal. And to expound on that, uh, collecting and organizing this data is an opportunity to gift my life's experiences to other enthusiasts and archaeologists alike with little or no exposure to taking or processing animals with Stone Age contextual tools. So me being able to put this book together and share it with others is the opportunity where not everybody has to go out and do it, but if you're going to be writing papers or doing any sort of archaeological, experimental archaeology work, the information in here is going to be extremely valuable for you because it's data collected from actual hunts. And as we discussed earlier, you cannot collect accurate data without actually hunting and seeing all of those different variables that you don't even know exist until being out there and actually hunting. So a lot of people can maybe build a lot of bows and arrows or spears or flint nap. And we discussed this many years ago in a short series that was called Talking Primitive. And we talk about it's easy to make art. If you make something and you hang it on the wall and it's beautiful, and congratulations, it's beautiful art. But being able to take that and apply it in the field, that, those are two vastly different things. And so what it actually takes to go out and use it. Got that one. Got that one. It's a lot harder than it sounds. A lot of people are under the idea that as long as there's an animal there and I can hit it with this arrow, 
it's going to run over and die. And that's really not true at all. People are very, very mistaken. Animals are a lot tougher than you think they are. There are many occasions where you can shoot something as small as a rabbit with a bow and arrow and lose it and it will get away from you. So hunting itself is going to give you so many more variables besides the hunt, but also penetrative data, how fast arrows need to go or how fast spears should go or how big they should be, depth of penetration. That's really what this book itself covers. I mean, it's 425 or so pages of data and information from real hunts. Over at this point, now over 60 big game kills with primitive hunting implements. So in The Secrets and Science of the Atlatl, I'm actually a little bit more harsh about this. I, I dive into it a little deeper, not really from the aspect of trying to give universities and archaeologists a hard time, but to perhaps give some perspective to it, because there are a lot of universities and archaeologists and experimental archaeologists that do seem to write a lot of papers on things that they really have no experience in. And so archaeology is something where actually excavating sites and dating and all that stuff, that's archaeology where experimental or practical application archaeology would be recreating things and then go using them and collecting data. But see, here's where the big problem is. Now, I'm not saying that I have a personal problem with universities or archaeologists because I actually have several friends that are archaeologists and I've done work at universities that are a little bit more accepting of it because they see the value in actually going out and using this stuff rather than just doing in-lab tests to more or less confirm what they're trying to prove. So here's really the issue that we're running into then with academia or universities is because of their increasing, let's call it a woke agenda, also ethics boards. It's getting very, very hard to get approved to do any sort of animal testing, especially live animals. Real hunts is off the table. In fact, Many people are really aware that a lot of universities have gone on this extreme woke agenda and now many are even proposing that primitive people didn't really hunt maybe at all. Maybe they just, you know, they weren't killers. They just went and scavenged animals that were found dead. You know, they were only eating on what they found. They were already dead. And of course, there's huge problems with that because if you go into the woods and you spend a tremendous amount of time in the woods like I do, it is very rare that you find an animal carcass, oh, this just freshly died here, and so cool, now I can scavenge and eat this. By the time you find it, it has already been torn apart by other scavengers. But realistically, animals don't just walk through the wilderness and be like, I think I'm gonna die now, and then tip over and die. No, as they get older and weaker or sick, predators will then chase them down and kill them. That's how it works. It's very rarely that, say, a deer is going to walk into the bushes, curl up, and go to sleep. It doesn't really work like that. They're typically going to be pursued and killed by predators. And, of course, early people would have been able to watch this happen, and they would have, this is long before any of the book stuff, we're talking a very, very long time ago, they would be able to see this and say, well, if those animals are going out and killing those animals for food, then we need to find a way to go kill those animals for food also, or let the other animals do the work and go kill it, then let us go kill the predators and take it from them. But any which way you slice it, early people were going out and hunting and killing animals at a far greater frequency than scavenging animals. But that all being said, I'm also not specifically saying that all the work they're doing is incorrect. What I'm saying is a lot of it is really skewed and a lot of things that are being published are not accurate in the eyes of a real hunter. And so then we take that information and say, well, this must have been how it, how it was done without actually having an understanding of how it was actually done. But you don't even know that that's not how it's done because your lab tests concluded, well, this works, so this must have been how it was done. But in the real world study, you find out very quickly that that actually is completely impractical and it's not how this would work. In fact, it would 
fail in real world tests, but universities or institutions are not allowing people to go out and perform real world tests. They would certainly never get any funding for it, but they won't give credit for it either. In fact, you're far more likely to get kicked out of the institution, get banned from everything, if you break all of those rules. So you are strictly forbidden to go out and actively hunt, kill an animal, butcher it, all within that context. And so how on earth can you expect to get real data when you're really being hamstrung, you're being restrained and held back from doing the real work? Well, luckily, people have mentioned that to me, saying, how are you even allowed to do this? Or how did you get funding for this? Well, we self-fund it here at Hunt Primitive. Every study that we do is self-funded, and there is no one to ask permission to because it's my business. So I can do really whatever I want within the confines of the law. So as long as we're following hunting laws and state laws, any of that sort of information, we are perfectly legal to conduct all of these tests. And there go, that's how the Secrets in Science collection was born. Me able to actually do these tests on animals that I'm already hunting and then sharing that information with universities. The sad part is many of the universities still will not take it and accept it because it goes against their agenda. So they're already like, absolutely not. We can't be at any part of this. We're just going to continue to do these studies that don't align with yours, but ours is at a university and you don't have a degree. So we clearly know better than you do. But then that begs the question of any other profession, let's just say using being a doctor, for example, you could go to med school, right? and get a degree, but they don't just turn you loose and say, okay, now go doctor people up. You have to go do, uh, I'm not exactly sure what it's called. Is it a residency or something where you go work with other doctors and they basically now teach you how it works in the real world. Because once you get your degree and you've read all the books and you pass the test, you can get an A in the class and it still doesn't make you a qualified doctor. Would you rather have, pose you the question like this, let's say that you had to have open heart surgery, right? And you have a choice. You can either have this old school doctor from another country that has no degree, but he's done over 150 open heart surgeries with flying success. Or you could have this student that just graduated. He's never done one, but he's read the book. Which one are you gonna choose? I'm going to choose the guy, I don't care if he's got a degree or not, I'm going to choose the guy that's actually done it 150 times and he's had a lot of success. This other guy, he may be really smart and have done a great job and have a lot to share and he may be wonderful in the future, but he's never done it. So I'm going to choose the guy that actually has the experience and the success. So that of course bleeds back into how can you actually have real data and experience without experiencing the actual hunt from equipment that you've built with contextual materials? Because that's a big issue as well. Many of these studies that are performed are done with modern glues, you know, epoxies, artificial nylon sinew instead of real components, using dowel rods instead of natural sticks that have a cylindrical grain pattern versus a uh, violated grain pattern cut from dimensional lumber. These things actually make a significant amount of di difference or for that matter even testing at lateral points being shot from bows and arrows which that doesn't make any sense at all. A point that's shot from a bow and arrow that's meant for an at lateral is going to give you a huge difference in momentum and you might only be looking at kinetic energy as opposed to momentum might be the more important factor that you should be looking at. So I think we've made that point exceptionally clear now that experimental archaeology and all these in-lab tests, they're great in many ways, but you're actually not going to collect the real work and the real data and real experience without actually going out and hunting. And it's the system itself, the university system, that doesn't allow this, or maybe it's the new woke agenda, whatever it may be that's really to blame for holding this information back. But that's why, again, we're self-funded and we put out these books, The Secrets and Science of Primitive Archery, Secrets and Science of the Atlatl, 
And then lastly, the secrets and science of building bows and arrows. And one more little key point that I wanted to bring up, and it's somewhat related, but not really, um, on the ethics side of it, ethics and hunting, whatnot, whether you agree with hunting or not, that's not particularly up to debate for me. Somebody that's grown up hunting has a totally different perspective than somebody that's not. So you can debate this all day long, whether you eat meat or you don't eat meat. In fact, one of the things that has been brought to my attention on the YouTube channels quite a bit is will somebody say, you're going to go to hell and God's going to judge you and what you're doing is wrong and all of this stuff. And so I would like to end with that saying, you know, in Genesis, it specifically says, take your bow and quiver full of arrows, go into the field and hunt some wild game for me. So it specifically says it in the Bible to go hunt. So if you're going to use a religious reference and say, well, God's going to judge you for killing these animals and eating them, uh, then I would suggest perhaps going and looking and researching the Bible more. And in fact, I know if you do a Google search and say, does it say in the Bible that you shouldn't eat meat? You're going to get several different references, things from uh, one in Psalms, Isaiah, and Daniel too, I believe. And if you go look at those passages, what it says is that you do not bring me offerings. You do not need to make sacrifices for me anymore. But earlier on, and I am not an expert on the Bible, but from my understanding of it, is that God required blood sacrifices and sacrificing your best of your crop or sacrificing the best of your animals in the beginning. Then later in Psalms and Isaiah, it says multiple times, do not bring me the, the killed bull. Do not bring me your burnt offerings. Do not kill this animal to sacrifice for me. I, God, do not need your food. Do not bring that to me. But it does not anywhere say not to specifically go and hunt and kill animals. In fact, Jesus it was very open about that, that he was a fisherman. Then he never specifically said anything about not hunting and killing meat. So you can do with that whatever you like. Like I said, I'm not an expert in it, but if you actually go research it for yourself as opposed to just regurgitating at what AI may have to say about it, you may find that it's not actually saying that you're going to go to hell for killing animals. The important part is that you're not going out and killing and wasting the animal because that is, it also says uh, in the Bible, I couldn't tell you offhand where, it says a slothen man, it says a slothen man roasts not the meat in which he killed by not roasting the meat that you've killed, but lay, letting it lay to rot is a sin. So it specifically doesn't say that you can't go kill the meat. In fact, it encourages you to go hunt wild animals and eat meat. It just says do not waste the meat. So I hope that you have enjoyed our chapter discussion on hunting and experimental archaeology. And in future episodes, we will be going through different chapters of both the secrets and science of primitive archery and the secrets and science of the atlatl. And many of the questions that you may have about the third book, the secrets and science of building bows and arrows, can already be found in the bow building tutorials and arrow building tutorials that are on the Hunt Primitive YouTube channel. So we have a tremendous amount of information on the Hunt Primitive YouTube channels and also so much more information that is that is so hard to cover in just a video in these books. The Secrets and Science of Primitive Archery and the Secrets and Science of the Atlatl which are available at HuntPrimitive.com especially if you want to follow along as we go through each individual chapter. So until next time best of luck on your own primitive building and hunting adventures. Thank <laughs> you.